All right, can you guys hear me? All right, let me just get this sorted here. This didn't go great during the tech check, so fingers crossed. How's everyone doing this morning? Yeah, yeah all right. There we go, love that enthusiasm. Okay, well there's part of my slides. Let's see if we can find the rest. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, so I'm here today to talk about zero dependency CLIs with Node.js. Uh, so first of all, I'll give you a quick intro. Uh, my name is Ian. Uh, I am an architect and the head of developer experience and open source at Neo Financial, which is a Canadian fintech startup. Uh, I'm also a Node.js contributor where I mostly work as a part of the tooling working group, which is kind of what I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, and you can find me on, uh, on Twitter and GitHub at Ian Soup. Okay, so what are we gonna cover here today? Uh, I apologize also if the text is a little small on my slides, but I'll be, I'll be kind of reading through most of the content, so you shouldn't miss anything. Uh, so yeah, up first we're gonna talk about what is a CLI app and why are we talking about them? Uh, what are dependencies and why are we trying to avoid them? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, why build CLI apps with Node.js? Uh, and then what new Node.js features can help us write CLI apps. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what new Node.js features might be coming next. Uh, so yeah, CLI apps, what are they? Uh, CLI just stands for command line interface. Um, it's basically just a fancy way of describing a script that takes some input and generates some output. Uh, these kinds of apps run in a terminal. They're commonly used for things like dev tools, build scripts, process automation, stuff like that. And they can range from pretty simple, like ls command uh, to much more complex, like git. Um, let's do a show of hands. Who has used a CLI before? All right, so a lot of you. Uh, who's built a CLI before? All right, still pretty good, pretty good numbers. Um, what about written like a shell script or something like that? Okay, yeah, pretty good number of you. And uh, so who, if you've built a CLI or a shell script, uh, did you do that with Node.js? Show of hands. Okay, all right, it's pretty good, it's more than I was expecting. Uh, so a lot of you are already familiar with, uh, with CLIs, uh, but I'm just gonna look at a couple quick examples here and we're gonna cover some like basic terminology. Um, so as an example, here's a screenshot of the ls command um, and a couple things to, to note here. Uh, so after the, the first uh, dash there, we've got a couple of, of options, uh, uh, l and one. Um, and, and those are sometimes uh, referred to as uh, just options or short options um, or short opts uh, or flags. They've got a lot of different names. And it's common, uh, there's actually two options there, the, the L and the one, and you could write that as LS dash L and dash one, but it's, it's common to combine them um, in that case. Then we've got a long option after that, which is the double dash color. Um, and those are also referred to as just options or sometimes long options. Um, and so this is an example of ls, pretty simple, CLI. Um, then, you know, here's a small example of git. Uh, here we're running the git status command. In this case, git is such a big CLI, it's actually broken up into a bunch of subcommands. So status is what we refer to as the subcommand here. And each subcommand takes uh, its own combination of flags and arguments and, and things like that. Um, so a much more complicated example of a CLI. Uh, okay, so why am I talking about CLI apps? Uh, so I work on a number of CLI apps as a part of my job, uh, and I use them daily. Uh, I also just really like CLI apps. They're a lot of fun to build. Uh, the terminal is a challenging and constrained kind of environment. Also, serious 80s vibes if you're talking terminal and CLI, just pretty cool. Um, 
And then also I'll, I'll mention, you know, the things that I'm talking about here don't just apply to CLIs. Um, there are other types of apps that, that share some of these constraints, like serverless functions, shell scripts, GitHub Actions, and more. Okay, so why build CLI apps with Node? Uh, so shell scripts are often written with scripting languages like Perl or Python, so why not Node.js? Uh, use the language that you and your team and your collaborators are already familiar with. I think that's a big bonus uh, of using JavaScript and Node. Uh, also, Node is really good at some things. Uh, so working with JSON data, that's highly optimized in V8 and in Node, um, more so than probably any other language. Um, and also like doing tasks in parallel, like reading and writing files, making network requests, uh, Node does that uh, in a very performant way and, and you know, has a relatively uh, straightforward syntax around that. Uh, and then Node has a huge package ecosystem. So I know in this talk I'm, trying to, I'm talking about avoiding dependencies, uh, but they are still really useful sometimes and NPM has a lot of them. So on that note of dependencies, uh, yeah, what are dependencies and why do we need them? So they're generally some other piece of code, like a library, that your program needs to run. Uh, and in Node, dependencies commonly come from and are installed with NPM. Uh, other users and contributors are also gonna need to install the same dependencies to, to use or work on your project. Uh, those dependencies also need to be installed at build time and deployed alongside your code. Um, and Node doesn't include a big standard library, um, and instead it relies on NPM packages. Um, other languages have standard libraries of varying sizes, um, and that just kind of means like what functionality is built into the language. Um, and early on in the, the design of Node, uh, there was a conscious deci decision made for Node to have a small core uh, and for NPM to be the choice for any additional functionality, which is why you see packages like isNumber uh, with millions of weekly downloads on NPM. Uh, okay, so are dependencies bad? I mean, <laughs> all right, we've got, we got some not fans of dependencies in the crowd. Um, I would say not necessarily, um, but they do introduce some overhead in development and deploy process. So like I said before, users are gonna need to install those dependencies to run your project or to work on it. You gotta install them or bundle them somehow at build time. Um, if you're building a, a complex app, like if you're building a microservice or something, chances are you already have a build and deploy pipeline and a bunch of dependencies, so adding in a few more likely isn't gonna make a big difference. But in the case of smaller apps and libraries, like CLIs or shell scripts, not having that build step uh, really makes uh, using and contributing and distributing that script much, much easier. Um, and yeah, like shell scripts are generally self-contained. You, you don't generally, you know, you can, you'll see a gist or something and copy and paste that into a script and run it. You don't usually install dependencies uh, when using something like that. And the other option that I mentioned is bundling your code using something like Webpack. Um, and there are tools out there, like for example, there's one called NCC uh, from Vercel that does this for you. Um, for CLI type tools. Uh, and as an example, um, at Neo, we have a CLI app called the Neo CLI. Uh, we're very creative uh, when it comes to naming. Uh, and the compiled version of that CLI is 12 megabytes. So it's 12 megabytes of minified JavaScript code just for a basic CLI app. So bundling is not always the best solution. Uh, and bundling with Webpack also doesn't work with all dependencies, so you're gonna, probably gonna run into issues there as well. Okay, so we're getting close to the good stuff. Uh, little disclaimer before I talk about what's new in Node.js, uh, I absolutely did not build all of this stuff. In fact, some of them I was in no way even involved with. Um, I mentioned working on the, tool, on the tooling group. Uh, we, that group was involved with a lot of this stuff, but not even all of it. Um, Node is a huge project with lots of collaborators and contributors, um, and so a ton of people worked on, on these features and the features that they rely on. Uh, so I just wanted to get that out of the way before I dive into this. Um, and also, we're gonna be using a little bit of new syntax in these examples, so I'll cover that here. Uh, you're gonna see me using import instead of require, uh, so that just we're using ES modules instead of CommonJS. 
Um, and in order to do that, you can just add type module to your package.json file um, or name your files with the MJS extension. The other new thing you're gonna see me using is importing node internals with the node prefix. So for example, import fs from node colon fs instead of just from fs. Um, and the reason for that is it, it kind of disambiguates uh, node built-in libraries from NPM packages. Um, basically every NPM name uh, is taken. So <laughs> we, we couldn't add anything new to node. There were no names left. Um, and so this new namespace kind of alleviates that problem. Uh, and it, it also does make it a lot more clear like where uh, the import is coming from. So when you see that, that's what that means. Uh, okay, here we go, on to the fun stuff. Argument parsing. So fun, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so simple scripts often don't take any inputs, um, but as they get more complicated, uh, you know, it might be helpful to accept uh, maybe some input from the user or like a file name or something or maybe some arguments. Um, and that also helps make those scripts kind of more general, um, more useful in more cases. Uh, and most languages provide at least a basic argument parser. Uh, the other thing is parsing arguments is surprisingly complicated and can be very tedious and error prone. So we're gonna look at a couple examples here. So let's say we have a CLI, uh, again, creatively called my CLI. Um, and let's say it takes an, a silent option. And so this is kind of a common uh, argument that a lot of CLIs take. It just means like suppress any output. Uh, so let's, let's look at the ways that we could pass this option. So the first one here, we could just do the double dash and the word silent. Uh, probably there's a short version of that as well, so you could just do dash s. Uh, sometimes you can do something like this, where you use the longer form and then uh, the equal sign and a value. So here we're saying silent equals true. You could also do the same thing without the equal sign. Uh, and then sometimes you can pass sort of an inverted version of the argument by, by uh, putting the word no at the beginning of, of the name. And uh, I mean, these all do the same thing. They just set the silent argument, just in many different ways. And so how do we handle this at this point, uh, or in the past, in Node? Uh, so Node gives us something called process.argv, uh, and all that is is an array of what was typed on the command line split anywhere there's, uh, there's blank space. And so in our examples, uh, with our first example, we get something like this. The first element in the array is always the uh, node executable itself, then the name of your script, followed by all of the arguments in the, in the rest of the array. So this one's kind of what we expected. We get that double dash silent. In the second case, we get that dash s. Now in the third case, because we didn't put any spaces around the equal sign, we get the key and the value in one array element. Uh, but then in the second case, we did use a space, so now the key and the value are in two different elements. Um, and then the, the last one is kind of just what we, we expect, the no silent um, as a single argument. Um, there are even more possibilities in edge cases here. Um, you know, there's, there's positional arguments, like say a file name, you know, if you think about like the CP command or something, it takes like a source and a destination as positional arguments. Um, short options that I mentioned can be specified individually or combined into one group. Um, some long options can take multiple arguments or they can be specified multiple times. Uh, some arguments contradict each other, like you can have a silent flag and a verbose flag. Uh, so this gets very it's very fast. And so, uh, yeah, most likely, you know, in the past, you're gonna reach for a library, a third-party library, something like Yargs or Commander that are kind of purpose-built for this. But, not anymore. There's a new way to do this in Node.js, uh, starting in Node 18.3, uh, and it is called Parsargs, and this is how it works. So, the first thing we're doing here is we, we just import Parsargs from Node colon util, uh, and then we, we do, uh, we wanna slice off the first two elements of that array. Remember that was the, the node executable and the name of our script. So we, we wanna get rid of those and we just wanna focus on the arguments. Uh, that's gonna be our input. Uh, and then we just declare the options that our program takes like this. So we say uh, there's, there's one option, it's called silent, it has a type, it's a Boolean. 
Uh, and then the short form of it is the letter S. And then we just pass all that to parsearg. So we give it our input array. We give it that uh, object of options, and it'll give us back the values. So let's see in, the, in those five examples that we just ran through, let's see what parsearg is going to give us in these cases. So in the first two, we just get silence set to true. Uh, that was with the dash dash silent or just the dash s. Um, in the, the second two cases, that's where we did dash dash silent equals true or space true. Um, it actually gives us an error. It tells us that uh, the, the silent option doesn't take an argument. Um, and then in the, the third case, or the, the last case, uh, it tells us that that no silent option uh, actually doesn't exist. So this doesn't support all of the functionality that we maybe previously had, but one thing you will notice is these are actually pretty good error messages. So like pretty suitable to display to users of your CLI. Uh, and yeah, so that's, that's kind of, that's parsargs available in Node 18.3. Uh, I believe it's also being backported to Node 16 uh, pretty soon. Um, and there's also a polyfill available at pkgjs uh, slash parsargs. Um, and this is, this is where we uh, actually initially developed this library, um, and we were work on it and discuss new features. So if you're interested in contributing to this or whatever, or getting involved, this is the place you want to go. Okay, so next, let's talk about fetch. Woo, yeah. Uh, fetch is a web API for making HTTP requests. People have been attempting to make fetch happen in Node for several years. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm legally obligated to use this GIF uh, when talking about node fetch. <laughs> um, so yeah, fortunately we didn't listen to that advice um, and fetch is now available in node 18. Uh, yeah. Well, it's been, a, been years in the making. <laughs> um, so fetch is built on top of Undici, uh, which is a new HTTP 1.1 client written for, from scratch for Node.js. And it's also built uh, with the WebStreams API, which is now available in node 18. So let's take a look at how fetch works. Uh, so uh, up, up first here, we just, uh, we just await fetch. And you'll notice we don't even have to import fetch. It's, uh, it's just available globally. Uh, so we just await fetch, and then this is the URL to my GitHub profile. Um, and then we also have to await uh, getting the JSON version of the body. That's because the, the response is streamed from the server. Um, for large responses, this is a big performance improvement. Um, and then after that, we just have a JSON object, which is part of my GitHub profile. So let's take, let's take a quick, quick look at what life was like before Fetch, and I'll tell you a little story. Um, so I learned a little while ago that if you use a subcommand that Git doesn't recognize, it'll look for a matching file in your path. So for example, if you typed git hello, uh, it would realize that hello is not a built-in subcommand, uh, and it'll actually look for a file named git-hello on your path, and if it finds it, it'll run it. Uh, which I thought was a pretty cool way to make a CLI app extensible. Um, and then a little while after that, I saw this tweet. Um, it says, Git blame should return Twitter handles. So if you're not familiar with Git blame, uh, it displays a file, and beside each line of code, it shows the name or the email address of the person who wrote it. Um, I guess the idea is you can you know, blame whoever uh, introduced the bug you just found. Uh, it usually ends up being you. Uh, just funny how, funny how it always works like that. Um, and yeah, this is kind of what it looks like uh, if what I ran this on, on the slides for this talk. And so it just shows you the lines of code and then my name next to them. Um, and then a little while later, I saw this follow-up tweet um, where the person is suggesting this command should be called git blast. Um, and I just learned how to add subcommands to git, so I thought, all right, I'm going to build this. Um, so essentially, I figured I'm going to need a, 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 basically a shell script. Uh, it's going to run git blame, and then every time it encounters like a new email address, it's going to hit the GitHub API with that email address. And then if the person's provided their Twitter username, uh, we're going to just fetch that and replace that uh, with their uh, replace the email with the Twitter username. But it does need to be a self-contained script, uh, and it needs to make a web request. And I wanted to use Node.js. So that means using the old built-in HTTP library. And here's a little bit of what that looks like. It's a lot of code. Um, so we import the library. 
Uh, it's not a promise-based uh, library, so we're doing a little work here to promiseify it. Um, we pass it a bunch of options, the host name, the port for some reason, um, the user agent, whatever. Uh, then we make our git request. Then it's an event-driven API, so we have to listen to events when, uh, again, that body's getting streamed from the server. So we're listening for each chunk of data, um, and then we do some stuff when it's done, and then there's some error handling. There's actually more code. It doesn't even fit all on this slide. Um, so yeah, not great. Um, so let's see what this looks like with fetch instead. There we go. That's it. That's the whole code. Uh, we went from more than 30 lines of code, which probably wasn't even complete, I'm sure there was some edge cases and error handling I was missing, to now less than 10. So yeah, huge difference. And uh, by the way, here's the output of Git Blast um, on, again, on my slides. I did actually make this, and you can use it. Um, please don't go yell at random people on Twitter about code that they wrote. <laughs> if you do, be nice. Um, okay, let's move on. I've only got a few more minutes here, so I'll go a little bit more quickly through some of the stuff at the end. Uh, test runner. Node now has a built-in test runner. So it's just a, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's just a basic API to create tests, both synchronous and asynchronous. Um, it supports subtests, skip to do only, et cetera, things you're used to from other test libraries. Um, can be used with uh, Node's built-in assert library. Um, and then it also includes a simple test runner. You can give it a list of files or to look in the test directory or look for certain file name patterns. Um, and you know, normally you might reach for something like Jest or Mocha, and those are great, uh, those are great test frameworks for large apps. Uh, but if you look at a lot of libraries on NPM, they're literally a single JavaScript file and a single test file with like a handful of tests. So this is something that's great in those kinds of use cases. And so here's what this looks like. We import the test library, and then, yeah, here's an example of a synchronous test. We're just asserting that one is equal to one. Likewise, we've got an asynchronous version where we're resolving a promise to one and asserting that that's equal. Uh, you can obviously do more interesting things with your tests than that. Uh, and then to run them, you just run node dash dash test, and it spits out some test output for you. All right. Uh, now to the, the slightly less interesting stuff, recursive file system operations. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, built-in methods like read file and unlink or whatever, they're great if you want to work with like one file or a small number of files. Um, but if you want to work with a large number of files or directories, uh, the recursive operations are really helpful. Um, in the past, doing any kind of recursive FS operations required pulling dependencies into your project, uh, but not anymore. So up first, uh, we've got the recursive makedir operation. So this works just like it does in your terminal. Uh, you know, we, we call makedir, we pass the recursive option there, and then it'll make any of those directories that are missing along the way. Uh, likewise, there's a new rm command. Works kind of similarly. Uh, you give it a, a file path. You say recursive true, force true, so it's just like rm-rf, um, and it'll delete, you know, if there's there's files, directories, whatever directory tree uh, in there, it'll delete everything. Uh, use with caution, it's, it's very good and very fast at deleting files, so just, <laughs> you've been warned. Um, this one is a little bit newer, recursive copy. Uh, so you, again, you just give it a source and a destination there, and the recursive flag, it'll copy that whole directory tree. Um, this is currently marked as experimental, uh, but it does work. Um, and then recursive read dir, there is a read dir command in Node right now, it'll just read like one level deep in, uh, in whatever directory you give it. The idea with this is it'll read the whole tree for you. Um, and so likewise, you just pass it that recursive flag. Uh, this doesn't exist in Node yet, there's actually an open PR for this right now, which I'm hoping will be merged uh, very soon. And uh, so yeah, that's all the new stuff that I wanted to talk about today. Let's take a quick look, I have two minutes, let's take a quick look at what might be coming next. Wild speculation edition. I have no insight on any of this, so this is just me saying stuff. Glob, uh, Glob allows you to use patterns to select multiple files, yeah. Pairs nicely with, uh, with recursive file system operations. Self-contained executables, you can compile an executable. Uh, you know, getting rid of that, that dependency install step is great, but you're still depending on your users to have a compatible version of Node installed, so this would solve that. Uh, TypeScript, 
I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, as far as I know, this isn't happening yet, but I have seen some chatter about it, uh, both on Twitter and there's, there's a group called uh, Next10. Um, they've been discussing it a little bit, so anything could happen. Um, and yeah, do you, wanna, do you wanna help figure out and maybe build what's next? Well, then you should join the Node Tooling Group, and you can find us there on GitHub. And uh, yeah, that's all I've got for today. Thanks, everyone.